Hi, I'm Sophie. And I'm Kate, and we're the hosts of Talking in Common podcast. Welcome to Being. Welcome back to Talking in Common. Hi, Soph. Hi, Kate. Excited to be back. Yes. Today we are joined by the lovely Yana Fuchs. Yana is the founder of Birth Education Workshop Radiant Birth. She's a trained dancer, qualified vinyasa, yin and prenatal teacher and mother to her daughter Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yana's passionate and very open about creating a strong community of like-minded women through the journey of motherhood. And Kate and I both believe it's so crucial that new mothers have a strong support network during such a transformative time in their lives. And there's a lot of complexity and vulnerability through this time as well. So we're absolutely thrilled to be chatting with you today, Yana. Welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. How are you feeling? Um, great. <laughs> <laughs> we were just all saying we all feel a bit nervy today, but... Yes, a little bit nervous, a bit out of my comfort zone, but that's all about motherhood right being sitting in the uncomfortable absolutely very good point <laughs> so we can't <coughs> wait to dive into all the wonderful work that you do and talk about motherhood and all the things that keep you inspired um, but we'd like to get a big nice picture of what makes you Yana so can you tell us a little bit about your background and your earlier years okay um where do I start do you want to start from the beginning let's start okay, from the beginning so um I um, am originally from South Korea. I'm actually adopted. So I came to Australia when I was four and a half months old. Um, my parents, um, yeah, they just didn't think that they could have children. So they went down the adoption route. It was very progressive for the time because you think it's the 80s. My mum was only 25 years old, which is very young. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they decided, I think um, people have a... We focus a lot on like the long, um, you know, the long IVF journey, but adoption is kind of similar, a similar route. I've heard that, that um, adoption is really difficult, like a really yeah, difficult process. Yeah, it's a really <coughs> difficult process. I think all and up it was like a four to five year journey, wow. you know. Um, the process in South Korea is that they match you up with your biological parents having a similar age. Oh, okay. Maybe they think that like they're trying to keep it as close. Mm, okay. That's so in, that's so interesting. Which is yeah. like not even a thing, thing you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then they find a baby for you, okay, and then the rest is history, really. My parents then um, obviously, you know, get the news that they're going to have a baby. They come over to Korea. They um, meet me in wow. a very kind a similar situation like this, probably a round table in an office wow. where they're told not to show any emotion as well because there's like an interpreter there who is um, not very good at speaking English mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. so there's like a lot of broken language barriers, cultural barriers as well, trying to show respect for either party. Mm -hmm. And then I'm taken away. Oh. Then 24 hours later, you meet your baby at the airport and then you're handed over. Wow. wow. Oh my yeah. God. With a bottle of formula and a baby carrier. Wow, that's, that's so it. wild. That's it. It's like here's the baby. Here's your, here's your baby. Your Imagine that your trip bottle. home that they had um, <coughs> with well, a new baby. I, yeah, and then, then, you, uh, then you become a mother. You become a father, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was the process, I guess, for my start of life. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, so I feel like in so many ways very privileged, um, privileged to be here, to be speaking, to have be granted an education, mm. um, to be talking about motherhood on the other side, coming mm. full circle. Mm -hmm. So yes, I guess that was the start of my, where it all began. Um, and then, you know, my mum, maybe just shy of six years later, um, fell pregnant with my sister, ah. who was their biological child, my sister. Ellie um yeah by surprise oh wow okay so there you go so and then how were you how was your upbringing in Australia what sort of things were you um, into what were your parents into so my dad was in the air force growing yeah. up so I went to six different primary schools we lived okay. in the UK okay um for a big stint of time and then we lived in I think I've lived everywhere yeah um I was like 
pretty full and pretty fruitful, you know, as far as like shifting and being movable. Mm. But um, yeah, there was always like, I lived in this kind of dichotomy of like being raised in a white family around white people, Mm. Mm. but being innately Asian, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't really feel like I felt that so deeply until we moved um, just like north of Um, Sydney on the central coast when I went to high school it's like a real coastal beachy sort of vibe and I think I was like the only Asian kid that went to high school you know and not (coughs) realizing on the other side now when I'm starting to look at you know at my daughter going to kindy you start you know she's going to school in a year so you start to look at schools and you start to think about like what it would be what kind of education system you would like to have your child in or not even education more like the environment Environment. that you want them to be in Mm. and yeah it's been really triggering because I'm like the first and foremost thing is for me like she needs to be at school obviously that you know fosters creativity and all of the um, parenting philosophies that we echo and sort of feel very strongly about but mainly she needs to be around other Asian kids you know people that look like her that there's lots of diversity because I want her to never feel displaced or feel that that pull that push and pull you know feels like she's really she feels too different different. she feels different you know um within that environment when you became a mum to your daughter Sunday Mm. can you tell us a little bit about I guess, what your introduction to motherhood was like or your um, journey leading into becoming a mum? Um, so, I it's funny because, you know, we don't really talk about conscious conception, mm. like, you know, mindful conception enough, I think, in this space. I, at the time, I thought she, like, Sunday was like an accident, you know, that happened, yeah. you know. Happy accident. Happy accident. Yeah. <laughs> but... Like, if I reflect deeply on it, it was, like, really a conscious decision that was made. We'd gone to Korea the year before. We went back to the adoption agency. I had – I was from – we had gone to the orphanage. It was, like, a real full healing journey for me. I went with my husband. We hung out with a bunch of different, like, adoptive Korean kids who were adopted who went and found their biological families and, like, Mm. moved back to Korea and rerouted, like, learnt about the history of, like, Korea at the time. You know, my friend um, Aaron, um, who we're actually going back to Korea later this year, but, like, he had just finished doing a documentary on adoptive kids in the 80s and how, like, Korea didn't have any natural resources and we were um, resourcing our babies Mm. for a cash injection you know Mm. like and single mothers were you know actually encouraged to give up their kids so there was like all these like learnings and like healing healing wounds that were happening at the time yeah then you know a few months later Sunday was conceived so you know like it was meant to be it was meant to be you know and then obviously we spoke about this before um her being a daughter like being my daughter like you know my only blood lineage Mm. that being a very healing process as well you Mm. know from coming full circle to accepting my mother yeah you know to becoming a mother yeah Yeah. so tell us so so you gave birth to Sunday yes and then within that first year you built your incredible business Radiant Birth can you tell us a little bit more about this community that you've built for expectant mothers and yeah so radiant birth was conceived about six months postpartum i feel like you know when we're um in that postpart those early postpartum Mm. phase and i'm really interested in it i talk a lot about it on um our space and like we have a journal series as well that really dives deeply into it but i feel like for the first time for a lot of us the first time we've gone from like doing to being Mm. actually sitting with ourselves listening to ourselves and within that silence there's this such a huge surge of creativity that happens and that happened for me you know I'm like naturally creative like naturally you know a little bit left and it just sort of happened like I wanted I entered matrescence with not much of a community yep I thought, how would it feel like to enter um, 
pregnancy with a community so before you're entered into some kind of postcode which kind of puts you in some mother's group and just because you're in a postcode doesn't mean that you share it common interests and you, you hear know? a lot of negative experiences yeah. from those mothers groups positive ones as well but yeah, equally po- yeah I feel like you know maybe one in ten gets a pod like I feel like pretty in tune with like people who have experienced that yeah. and then obviously the mothers group during COVID was actually stripped away yeah for so many people oh, yes. <laughs> I was really so, connected oh, yeah. yeah I never did mothers group <clears throat> yeah mom school dropout it's the best yeah. <laughs> um But, yeah, how would it feel to enter such a huge period of your life from pregnancy um, to birth to postpartum with that shared experience Mm. being the course, you know? Um, But obviously being so into, like, Eastern medicine, I really wanted to integrate that in a really holistic and kind of um, honourable way that paid respect. So we have, like, a TCM doctor that leads postpartum as well so postpartum is really integrated within the course of course we have like a big component that's birth education Mm -hmm. that integrates you know you know the energetics and physiology of birth um as well as you know pranayama and like you know sound and movement and yoga that you know can be integrated for like actual like labor Mm. but yeah I think postpartum is often neglected and we kind of step into matrescence feeling obliterated without preparing for it. So what happens if that was just kind of like a verbatim? Do you know what I mean? No one talks about matrescence either, you know, more so now. But when I first had um, my first baby, Mm. it wasn't really a thing. Like, no, none of my friends had kids, like, Mm. really at that time. But when I eventually read more about that, I was kind of – I was pretty mind-blown because it made sense, but no one had ever mentioned it to me before – Whereas, like, adolescents, we talk about that all the time, you know, entering into such a transformative time in your life, but not when you become a mum. It's like, okay, now you've got a baby, now you've just got to learn to to parent, Mm. you know? Exactly, yeah. Mm. Is there something that's traditional in Korea that you've practised? Yeah, so it's very similar Similar. to the... 40 days of... Yeah, just 40 days of rest. I mean, there's some things that, um, I mean, I couldn't do, which was, like, not washing... You know, but resting, connecting, eating warming foods, Mm. um, yeah, and um, just focusing on healing, Mm. breastfeeding and becoming a mother and just sitting with yourself. But that, I also want to say that also comes with like a huge amount of privilege as well because, Mm. um, you know, to do that you need resources and you need – Financial, support. you know, support. Um, and do you think that that happens for second-time mums? Absolutely not. They're, like, up the next week. They have got three-year-olds that they need to take to the park mm. or kindy drop-off or, you know, it's... Um, whole number of... There's a whole matter of factors, Very you know. Mm. Yeah. Not everyone has access to a postpartum doula or can invest mm. in their health in that sort of way. Mm. I, yeah, really want to make... I don't want to, like, cloud people's, you know, feeling like they are failing by not doing something like that. Mm. But I guess it's more just the smaller learnings that you can take from it. Maybe it's, like, saying no to someone when you don't really want a visitor. Yeah. Or instead of getting some more onesies, you can just ask for someone yeah. to what bring some you, lunch yeah. over yeah. for you, you what know. What you actually need. Or um, <coughs> yeah. I think just... Also, like, not putting that pressure on yourself in those first, well, first few months, really. Like, allowing yourself to just be and that that's okay because, you know, I think think probably society puts a lot of pressure on us as well that you think you need to be doing all these things, you need to be up and about, you need to be seeing people when really you need to be focusing on your baby and resting because... But I think for all of us... Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I think for all of us, like, in our Western society, it's just a cultural lack. We're not brought up mm. with, you know, like this 40 days of sitting or, yeah. you know, we're not it, we're not 
made aware or educated or t- taught that that's okay. You know, we're taught the opposite. So yeah. because we have bounce back culture, <coughs> yeah. Like you don't look like you've had a baby. Mm. Like how yeah. toxic is, is that, that yeah. language? You know, why that's would I want to look like I haven't just had, had a baby? A baby yeah. 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 yeah, I have, and like it's the most profound thing that's ever happened, happened. to me. Yeah, and totally. it's almost offensive saying that I don't even look like a mum because I'm totally. a whole new person. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. know? Although mum being at F45 five weeks in, because she obviously feels that she needs to get back out there and yeah, exercise. Exactly, and, and that is just from like a certain way. Yeah, Western culture. Whereas, like you know. Um, in so many parts of Asia and China and Korea and Indonesia, mm-hmm. these are kind of non-negotiables. Mm. No matter how rich, no how matter how poor, because people come together because they know how freaking important it is. You yeah. know, yeah, they know that the survival of the mother is the ecosystem. That mothers are the start of an ecosystem. Without us, society doesn't exist. Mm. Yeah, your <laughs> personal experience with sort of finding a community first and then also like the outcomes that you've seen from the women that you support as well? I think Bobby Clark really nails this one. I read an interview with her recently. It's like it was – I can't really say Mm quote-unquote, but she said something along the lines of, you know, you've got to – you don't – community is not going to knock on your door you have to be open you have to open yourself you've got to you know what does Elsa say like you've got to open the floodgates right (laughs) of Arendelle you do you have to open yourself up to community Mm. and connecting to different people um so I feel like to start creating that that means being vulnerable Mm. it means like being at a play park with your kids and like smiling to the mother next Mm -hmm. to you and Like, hey, how old's your kid, you know? Mm. What's happening, you know? And then that conversation might lead into something else. Oh, where do you live? Oh, do you live around the corner? Oh, cool. Maybe we should grab a coffee sometime, you know? Yeah. Mm. Um, I've actually met so many amazing friends through play parks and, you know. That's such common ground when you're in that space with your kids Yeah, totally. Um, You mentioned before that you were adopted from a Korean background. So I guess from your perspective and from a mental health and well-being perspective – what are your thoughts on the importance of inclusion within communities? Oh, f- oof. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's a big question. <laughs> huge question. Yeah. I think the motherhood space or whatever you want to call it, like this motherhood space is like very white. Mm. Um, I think the birthing community is very white as well. I'm currently studying with Rhea Dempsey at the moment. There's like 15 Amazing. women training to be birth attendants there and I'm the only Asian woman. Okay. Yeah. There's definitely systemic problems. I don't really have the answer to mm. it, but um, yeah, as far as like community as it feels at the moment, it feels very white. Mm. It's a real shame for lack of a better word because like within, if we're talking about community, within communities, I think diverse perspectives are so valuable mm. to everybody but we're not going to get those diverse perspectives if it's not an inclusive environment. And, you know, you can say inclusive environment again and it can mean yeah. a bit like what does that yeah. mean and, and maybe a bit of a token. But if it's not a really safe place for people to feel included, then they're not going to feel comfortable to express their mm. diverse perspectives. Mm. So, like, we're the ones missing out by not encouraging true, true inclusivity you know what and I mean? I think it's, and then yeah, I think it's really like also like the white women doing the work, you know. Mm. I'm not talking like posting a person of colour on your Instagram feed because you, so think, much because, you now. Think, yeah. because you think that's the right, right thing, thing to, to do. do. Yeah. I'm like fucking do the work from the inside, mate. Yeah. Like, you know, do the work from the inside. Like if you have a business and you're wanting to like champion like diversity and mm. like um, different stories – then hire people from the inside yes. yeah. to do the work. Yeah. You know, you can only do the work by listening and learning. Yep. Like yep. If, you, if you actually really want to raise your kids mindfully, mm. then do the work. Mm. Well, Yana, we could keep talking to you for days and I feel like we've only kind of just touched on some really important topics. Mm. Um, I don't really want this chat to end. Mm. Um, okay. But... Let's just continue it offline. (laughs) But let's just finish off with a couple of things that you do for yourself to make yourself feel well or make yourself feel good. Okay. 
long showers. Yeah. Mm, <laughs> Love nice a long one. shower. I wish I had a bath, but it's not the case. <laughs> um, fresh air, going for a walk. Even an evening walk is beautiful once mm. the kids are asleep, you know. Mm. That's really great. Mm. Um, yoga, but that is like, I'm going to be honest, few and far between. That mm. happens. Um, is it because it's moment. your work as well? Yeah, because it's because of work yeah. and just you know weekends and mm. all that kind yeah. of stuff. Mm. Um, and cooking. Yeah, I love cooking. I feel like <laughs> cooking is just like such a beautiful way to decompress after a day. You know, Michael's like you know rallying the bedtime stuff that's happening in the background but yeah cooking your recipes all look amazing when mm. I see you posting <laughs> on Instagram mm-hmm. yeah but yeah I love cooking I feel like that's a really nice wind down mm. for a day yeah yeah I agree if you give yourself the time to enjoy it yeah very enjoyable yeah. <laughs> Yana thank you so much we truly truly appreciate you taking time out of your day to oh. be with us and share all of your knowledge and your experiences and your personal insights as well as your professional insights so Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Yana. Thanks. (laughs) Thank you.